23. Getting off the fence. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou work cold or hot. 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Revelation 3 verses 15 to 16. The goal of this book has not been to heal the wounds or to create any new ones, but rather to present the simple facts so that the reader may decide which side he belongs. Bible believers are those who have prayerfully studied the issue without being swayed by personalities and alma maters. The Bible version controversy will only end when those who claim to be fundamental in the faith recognize that one book stands alone in presenting those fundamentals of the faith and that all the other versions are simply pawns in the hands of the wicked one. Each of us must decide what we believe about the issue of the Word of God. There is no room for fence straddling, indecision, or lukewarmness. Jesus is coming back and he requires that we be found faithful concerning the truth, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2. The underlying issue throughout one book stands alone is one of authority do you have a final, infallible authority under which you submit? God's perfect, infallible word is the only thing that qualifies for this kind of submission. So, where is it? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14 verse 6. The reader really has only two simple choices to follow the way of Jesus, which is the way of truth, or to follow the way of the world. If one chooses to follow Jesus, he can avoid the very destructive course that so many others have stumbled. David chose the way of truth. I have chosen the way of truth, thy judgments have I laid before me, Psalm 119 verse 30. There are those who cause others to speak evil of the way of truth. The false teachers among the believers mentioned in 2 Peter 2 verse 1 are an excellent example, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Two and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, 2 Peter 2 verses 1 to 2. Much of the criticism directed at the King James Bible comes from these false teachers. Every pastor, preacher, seminary professor, Sunday school teacher, and Christian must personally decide where he or she stands on the issue of the Bible. Do we have God's word available today or did God fail to keep his promises? The wrong decision and position will cause others to speak evil of the way and put you in the same category as those individuals who openly and knowingly oppose Christ. It does not matter how spiritual one appears to be, or how many degrees he has earned. Some people wonder how seemingly great, godly, spiritual men can be wrong concerning all of these modern versions. Ask yourself how so many intelligent people with earned doctorates are trying to find out how we evolved from apes and when the Big Bang took place. Without regeneration there is no illumination. Without a faithful belief in God's promise of supernatural preservation, there is no light. Spiritual and scriptural infidelity can happen to anyone, whether he is a pastor, preacher, or Bible teacher. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, fooled everyone around him except the Lord. The Lord allowed him to continue in his position although he was a devil and eventually Satan incarnate, John 13 verse 27. The Lord knew Judas Iscariot would eventually betray him, but the others could not discern who the betrayer would be, Matthew 26 verses 22 to 23. John 6 verse 64, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. John 6 verse 70, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Judas accepted the position knowing that he did not believe in the work of the Lord. The Lord knew and Judas knew, but we have no record that any of the other apostles even suspected him. Why? Because Judas was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Although not all the Bible critics are lost, many unbelieving men have infiltrated our seminaries. The Jesuits were established for this specific purpose. They devoted the time and effort to get the degrees, especially in the original languages, with the sole purpose of destroying the Protestant movement and true Christianity. They have infiltrated our seminaries and negatively influenced our schools and pulpits around the world. Their diligent, determined attacks have severely impacted the most influential position within the church, the pastorate. Young men enter the seminaries having obeyed the call of God on their lives. They arrive on campus with zeal and a heart of fire. But something changes. 
For many of them, the book that saved them and the one that set them afire is not reverenced by their teachers and is actually ridiculed and questioned. By the time they graduate, they look at that same book with disdain, some even apologize for reading from such an archaic source. Why has God allowed this infiltration to occur? The answer is quite simple. God has allowed these unbelievers and spiritual infidels to infiltrate our schools in order to prove us, similar to the way in which he proved Israel. Judges 3 verse 1 Now these are the nations which the Lord left, to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan, two only that the generations of the children of Israel might know, to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. For and they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. God could have eliminated the heathen nations for Israel, but he didn't. The four reasons why God allowed the wicked nations to remain in the land are clear. To prove Israel, verse 1. To teach their succeeding generations, verse 2. To teach them how to fight, verse 2. To find out if they would obey the Lord, verse 4. God wants to prove us, too. He does not want us to forget our rich Christian heritage. He wants us to learn how to fight, and he wants to know if we are willing to obey him not only during times of blessing, but also in times of trial as well. The churches are crumbling from within because we have lost sight of the enemy. Shamefully, we have more fighting amongst church members and between the deacons and pastor than against our real enemy. Israel failed miserably, too. Instead of learning how to fight and how to submit obediently, they became as their enemies. The infiltration by the enemy worked. Israel served their gods and forgot the true God. Once the infiltration began, wicked alliances were forged and Israel's demise was forthcoming. Judges 3 verse 6 And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. 7 And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their God, and served Balaam and the groves. We have been guilty of failing to learn the lessons of history, 1 Corinthians 10 verses 6 and 11. The infiltration has occurred within our institutions of higher learning, secular and religious. The Lord Jesus Christ warned of men who would come in sheep's clothing. They would look like sheep, act like sheep, talk like sheep but their sole purpose would be clear to destroy the work of God. They are similar to the betrayer of the Lord. Judas knew who he was and these individuals do as well. Matthew 7 verse 15 Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. 16 Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles? Their fruits will be the dead giveaway. What have all of these professors done to the way of truth and true biblical Christianity? What are their fruits? You can't look at the numbers, popularity, or money, 1 Timothy 6 verse 5. Big churches today are more easily built on falsehood and the lack of biblical truths than on spirit-filed scriptural preaching. Counting the numbers does not reflect true fruit. Churches today are producing a generation that knows not God. They have taken the cream of the crop in the seminaries and institutions of higher learning and systematically destroyed the faith of a generation. They continue to produce preachers with a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. When the student is taught to stand in judgment on the word of God, rather than allowing it to judge him, he loses his power, Luke 4 verse 32, Hebrews 1 verse 3. Paul warned about these wolves entering in among the sheep. Acts 20 verse 29 For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Thirty also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Once the wolves have entered, verse 29, their converts, verse 30, rise from within continuing the degenerative and destructive cycles. Times have not changed from Jesus' day. Religious hypocrisy ran rampant then just as it does today. Religionists were the Lord's staunchest critics and the very ones who nailed him to the cross, using the Roman civil government. He issues the same warning for us today. Matthew 16 verse 11 How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? 12 Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Groups calling themselves Pharisees and Sadducees do not exist today among professing Christians. 
However, the same wicked philosophy and doctrine does exist within many churches, Bible colleges, and seminaries. If the Lord were walking this earth today, he would be busy sounding the alarm against the apostate seminary professors who think they can correct God's words. Ezekiel gives a bleak survey of the spiritual condition in his day. The church and world today clearly resemble Israel of old. Israel's prophets devoured souls. Ezekiel 22 verse 25 There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey, they have devoured souls, they have taken the treasure and precious things, they have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Israel's priests refuse to distinguish between the holy and profane. 26 Her priests have violated my law, and have profaned mine holy things, they have put no difference between the holy and profane, neither have they shewed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Israel's princes were like wolves ravening their prey. 27 Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey, to shed blood, and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. Israel's prophets impersonated God's true spokesman. 28 And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity, and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. Israel's people oppress the poor and needy. 29 The people of the land have used oppression, and exercised robbery, and have vexed the poor and needy, yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Israel's God sought for a man. 30 And I sought for a man among them, that should make up the hedge, and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Passages like this give little hope of repair from within a corrupted nation, church, or religious organization or institution. The Bible tells us that God sought for a man among them to stand in the gap, but he found none. Those who know the truth are going to have to get the job done, because there is little hope of these institutions ferreting out the wolves. We need men to stand up for the way of truth willing to restore it by standing up alone if necessary. Will it happen from inside these organizations? Probably not, since God's pronouncement against Israel has direct spiritual application today. He found none among those who had corrupted his way. Having emphasized the battle so much, we must pause to consider how we are to be true servants of the Lord today. Israel went into a country or city and frequently annihilated it. How are we to handle things today? Should we step up with guns blazing? No, Bible believers cannot allow the flesh to control their actions, but must spiritually handle the matter. We must scripturally instruct those who oppose themselves and those who oppose us. The Bible says that maybe God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. What more can you ask for? What more can we pray for? 2 Timothy 2 verse 24 And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. 25 In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. 26 And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. True Bible believers must be instructors. We need to be instructing those who oppose the truth, oppose the book, and oppose those who stand for the truth and the book. Sadly, Christianity is ignorant of its great heritage. At the crux of the problem is the revisionist view of history so prevalent today. Even so-called Protestants are trying to forge new links with Roman Catholicism. They turn a blind eye toward, or simply fail to realize, the bloody history of that organization and its loyalty to someone besides the Lord Jesus Christ. Protestants and Baptists have no business trying to find common ground with those who pervert the truth by mixing it with error. These groups elevate religion and try to destroy those who stand in the way of their building of an empire. The professing church has always carried out the persecution of those who stood for the truth Consider Tyndall, Luther, Huss, etc. History reveals that those wearing the clerical robes are the main culprits causing spiritual darkness and apostasy. Paul warned that the majority of the corruption would come from within the religious community itself, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17. These impostors will intentionally deceive the unsuspecting. They will use deceitful means to perpetuate their false doctrine. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2 But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Ephesians 4 verse 14 that we henceforth be no more children, 
tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. The Apostle Paul says that there were many people corrupting the word of God by handling it deceitfully. Some of these men even had letters supposedly written by Paul, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 2. Evidently, the Spirit-led Christians had the spiritual discernment to distinguish between the truth and the counterfeit. Finally, Paul directs the believers at Ephesus to grow up and quit being children swayed by every new thing they hear. We need greater spiritual discernment to ferret out the wolves, and only God's word can provide the necessary wisdom. Satan knows that he has to convince people to pick up a counterfeit Bible before his master plan of deception can work. He has used many men and women quite effectively to attain his goals, but none as successfully as Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort understood man's propensity to believe the outlandish. Their theory of textual history played upon man's sinful nature. Once Westcott and Hort were dead, the so-called scholars at some major conservative Bible colleges and seminaries accepted their theory of textual history because they feared the scholastic and intellectual ridicule that comes with standing for the truth. Try to imagine how anyone familiar with the magnitude of the evidence as presented here and elsewhere could allow himself to become entangled in this web of deceit. They feared losing their position, their prestige, and their paycheck. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Proverbs 29 verse 25. The real issue at stake is one of final authority. Having been presented with the evidence, you the reader must now decide your own course of action. However, your spiritual condition will affect your course and that of those you influence. It is time to quit straddling the fence. Choose your side. Choose your weapon. Will it be the sword of the spirit, the word of God, or the modern version butter knife? Should you choose the sword, you will certainly be in good company. I, the Lord Jesus Christ. No one could present the issue any more plainly or succinctly than the Lord. God in human flesh proclaimed that you are either for him or against him, no middle ground. He accepts no neutrality. You cannot serve two masters. Matthew 12 verse 30 He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Matthew 6 verse 24 No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. God's man has always been given the responsibility of making people face the truth. A decision must be made. You must decide. Can you honestly hold your Bible in your hand and say, Thus saith the Lord? Or are you going to hold your finger up to test the winds? If you are still licking your finger, you should get out of the pulpit, out of the classroom, and out of the way. You can only have one master, and he demands that you choose your side. God wants you either cold or hot, Revelation 3 verse 16. 2. Nua. Joshua was a real man. He did not wait to see what everyone else was going to do. He did not wet his finger and stick it into the air to see which way the spiritual winds were blowing. When he gave his clear-cut position, he told his listeners to choose a side for themselves. Joshua let everyone know that his decision was not contingent upon the decisions of others. He plainly put the issue before the people as follows. Joshua 24 verse 15 And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What about you? Is your finger in the air concerning this issue before us? Or are you willing to be a Joshua and take the lead? The Lord made it clear that he does not want any fence straddling. God's man must be willing to stand and sometimes he must stand alone. The word of God demands that we choose. 3. Moses Moses also points out that there is no middle ground, no middle of the road, and no fence straddling with God. Whose side are you on? The neutral countries in a war sometimes suffer as many casualties as those actively involved in the battle. Innocent bystanders have the most to lose because they have nothing to gain. Are you trying to be neutral? Are you a bystander? Answer Moses' question. Exodus 32 verse 26 Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Take a stand. Be willing to stand up and be counted. The time is now. 
the lines are drawn. Where do you stand? Is your God a God of your possessions, or the one and only true God and creator of all things? God's word is pure. God's word is perfect. God's word has been preserved. Are you ready to proclaim this truth? Are you now convinced where to find it? 4. David. Quite frequently our sinful condition interferes with our desire to do right. David asked the people to make a decision. He wanted to know if they were willing to consecrate, set apart, their life for service to the Lord. Are you willing to consecrate yourself to his service? 1 Chronicles 29 verse 5, And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? Each of us must answer for himself. No one can make another person live a holy life. A familiar saying expresses this truth best, the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. Which will it be in your life, sin and compromise? Or holiness and steadfastness? V. Elijah. Elijah put a choice before the people the options were simple. Follow the Lord or follow Baal, false religion and a lie. The seminary professor faces the same choice who places his degrees, his alma mater, or his reputation above the word of God the King James Bible. Bible. False religions like to claim that Jesus was a great prophet, but reject his deity. Seminary professors love to proclaim their love for God's word, but reject his promise of supernatural preservation. The truth is harmed more from within than from without. The unfaithful seminary professor is more destructive than all of the false religions put together. 1 Kings 18 verse 21 And Elijah came unto all the people, and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Elijah did his job. He made the people consider where they stood. Sadly, they behaved like many do today. They did not answer Elijah. Today, we are faced with the same situation. Either you are going to associate yourself with God's position, with Satan's position, or try straddling the fence. What will it be? Decide today while you still have an opportunity. Others are looking around for someone to take the bull by the horns. Maybe it is you. You could be the one that God is looking for to stand in the gap. Others will follow or you could find yourself like Lot. 6. Lot. Shamefully, people would rather put the decision off to delay facing up to their sin and sinful condition. Some people today are as guilty as Lot. He delayed making an important decision and it ended up costing him his city, his home, his position, his sons-in-law, his two daughters, his wife, his wealth, and his popularity. Indecision is not worth its high price. Genesis 19 verse 16 And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth, and set him without the city. God was merciful to Lot his indecision did not cost him his life. However, any true man of God would rather die than live in disgrace like Lot. Your indecision will cost you dearly maybe as much as it cost Lot. Maybe more. Furthermore, your hesitancy will make you very unstable. Unstable, indecisive people are some of the sorriest people with which to be associated. They adversely affect everyone around them and make godly Christians very uncomfortable. James 1 verse 8 A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. God does not promise a reward to anyone who has wavering convictions. He wants every person to decide, and today is the day of decision. A person's unwillingness to make his position known causes others around him to fall. God despises the one straddling the fence. He wants you to boldly let your position be known. Revelation 3 verse 15 I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou work cold or hot. 16 So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. A wise person once said, when truth and error compromise, truth always loses, because error has nothing to lose. Christians have much to lose once their Bibles are taken from them. We need some valiant men and women, unafraid of the potential for ridicule, to stand in the gap. This world has an abundance of wimps. Jeremiah 9 verse 3, And they bend their tongues like their bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Has God shown you the issue? Are you willing to stand in the gap and show yourself valiant? 
If the Lord were walking this earth, I believe he would make each of us face this important decision. Whose word is most important to you? Jeremiah 44 verse 28 Yet a small number that escaped the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah, and all the remnant of Judah that are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall know whose word shall stand, mine or theirs. Whose word will stand for you? God's or theirs? The King James Bible or the latest modern version? If we put ourselves under the authority of this one book, we may stray, but we won't stay away from him for very long. If we stray, we will always know where to return. God wants us to worship him in spirit and truth, John 4 verses 23 to 24. What is your decision? Where do you stand? There is no middle ground and no neutral position. You are either for God's word, the King James Bible, or you are against it. One book stands alone, Will you stand with it? Or will you stand against it? Glossary of Terms Absolution the false teaching of Roman Catholicism declaring the person innocent. They teach that the Catholic priest has authority to remit the sins of a person that confesses his sins to him, no matter how heinous the crime. American Standard Version, ASV, the English Revised Version printed in the United States in 1901. The great granddaddy of all the modern versions. See the English Revised Version. A millennial the teaching that the 1,000-year period of Revelation chapter 20 is not a literal 1,000 years. According to a millennialism, the events recorded about the millennium are to be interpreted symbolically. This means that the binding of Satan, the resurrection, and the 1,000-year earthly reign of Christ are simply symbols of the present church age and of the heavenly condition of saints, not literally future events yet to come. Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. Celibacy the act of taking vows to become a priest or nun in Roman Catholicism, pledging to remain unmarried. Common era, C, used to denote Anno Domini in the year of our Lord, while refusing to recognize the birth and deity of the Son of God. Crusades the wars fought against the Muslims to claim the Holy Land for Rome. The Pope promised special privileges to the participants including the remission of sins, absolution for transgressions committed in the course of the crusade, and cancellation of personal debt. Cum privilegio Latin word meaning with privilege. The King James Bibles printed in England must have this designation signifying that the Bible is being printed in the name of the crown. Doceticism a heresy which claims that Joseph was the father of Jesus. It attributes to the person of Christ only a manhood and not deity. This was especially prevalent during the early centuries AD dogmatic unwaving, asserting or disposed to assert with authority, usually perceived in a negative way. However, every Christian should be dogmatic concerning Bible truths. Dynamic equivalency theory a method of Bible translation that translates thoughts rather than words. During the last two decades, this new concept has been developed in the field of Bible translation which has affected the kind of Bibles being produced. It is also known as common language translation, idiomatic translation, impact translation, indirect transfer translation, and thought translation. English Revised Version ERV, the project sanctioned by the Convocation of Canterbury in 1870 to revise the Authorized Version, which produced the Revised New Testament in 1881 and the Old Testament four years later. Doctors Westcott and Hort led in the 30,000 changes made to the text and completely ignored the Convocation's directive to introduce as few alterations into the text of the AV as possible. Granville Sharp Rule A Rule of Quine Greek developed by Granville Sharp in the late 1790s. This rule has been used by textual critics to justify the changing of many scriptures. It fails to recognize that the writers used a Hebraism called Hendiadi, Endiadis, which means one by means of two. Hebraism dash, see Granville Sharp Rule. Hendiadi, see Granville Sharp Rule. Homophobia literally one who fears homosexuals. The name is misapplied by the pro-homosexual lobby attaching it to those that judge the sin. Immaculate Conception Decreed by Pope Pius IX on December 8, 1854. Rome teaches that Mary alone was born without sin. Along with this doctrine is the teaching that Mary did not commit sin at any time during her life. They ascribed to her the attribute of impeccability, which means she could not sin. Since the wages of sin is death, a sinless Mary would never have died. Inquisition Rome's answer to the Protestant Reformation was the Inquisition under the leadership of the Jesuits, an order founded by Ignatius Loyola. 
He believed in absolute and unconditional obedience to the Pope. Their supreme aim was the destruction of heresy, which they defined as any thinking that differed from that of Rome. The primary methods of the Jesuits were schools, the confessional, and force. For example, they were responsible for St. Bartholomew's massacre in France. They killed 70,000 separatist Christians in one night. Lectionaries books containing selected passages of scripture employed by the early churches for congregational reading. Living Bible First copyrighted in 1972, a paraphrase written by Kenneth Taylor. Morning Star refers to the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation 22 verse 16. The modern versions change Lucifer to the Morning Star in Isaiah 14 verse 12. Thus Lucifer is not revealed in the modern versions and is replaced by the Lord Jesus Christ. Neo-Orthodox the modernists restructured their agenda to present themselves as more orthodox in belief after realizing that they had moved too far to the left too quickly. Whereas the old modernism blatantly denied the Bible as the word of God, neo-orthodoxy professed to believe in inspiration, but gave the biblical term an unbiblical meaning. They taught that inspiration did not refer to the words themselves, but the inspiration of the concept or ideas. The neo-orthodox theologian uses the fundamentalist's terminology, but the modernist's dictionary to define the words. New American Standard Version copyrighted by the Lockman Foundation beginning in 1960. Updated again in 1995 changing some of the verses back to the King James Bible readings and many of the pronouns when referencing deity. New World Translation, NWT, first copyrighted in 1961 CE. The translation produced by the cult known as the Jehovah's Witnesses attacks key doctrines, especially the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pedophiles one that chooses children to satisfy their perverted sexual pleasures. Perpetual virginity, the false teaching of Roman Catholicism that Mary never consummated her marriage with Joseph and had no other children by him. Politically correct current political and moral climate causing many people to reject the truth in order to be more in tune with the lax moral climate. Preservation the doctrine of God's promise to keep his very words in every generation. The supernatural conveyance of the inspired text throughout all ages without loss or error. The same God that perfectly inspired the scriptures also promised to perfectly preserve the scriptures not merely its teachings, but his very words. Progressive salvation, a heretical teaching that salvation occurs over a process of time and not instantaneously at the moment the person accepts Christ as Savior. Protestant historically this term derived from the 16th century Protestant Reformation in Europe. The name originated with a group of German princes who protested against the Pope in 1529 and has come to be applied to those denominations which arose from the Reformation era. Baptists are not Protestant. Purgatory according to Roman Catholic theology, a place or state where Catholics go after death to suffer for sins not cleansed during their earthly existence. The doctrine of purgatory teaches that even when the guilt of sin has been taken away, punishment for it may remain to be cleansed after death. Without adequate penance for their sins, a cleansing must occur after death with punishment designed to purge away their debt. The Roman system teaches that the faithful on earth can help those in purgatory by offering for them the sacrifice of the mass, prayers, almsgiving, and other religious deeds. Revised Standard Version, RSV, first copyrighted in 1952. The copyright page shows that it was a revision of the ERV and the ASV. The ESV, 2001, is a revision of the RSV. Seminary A School for Training Christian Workers, usually on a graduate level. Sexual Orientation, the false teaching that those attracted to the same sex were born with this propensity. Therefore, they are not to be judged according to the condemnation against such actions found in the scriptures. Sexual Preference, the true teaching about one's sexual propensities. It reflects that one's attraction to the same sex is a matter of choice. Sinaiticus, or Aleph, the 4th century manuscript rescued by Count Tischendorf from a trash can in St. Catherine's Monastery. Although disagreeing with the Vaticanus in over 3,000 places in the Gospels alone, it joins with Vaticanus to form the basis of the modern versions. Situational ethics the thesis that what is right in a moral problem is more dependent on the immediate situation than on a general code. It is the opposite of moral absolutes as taught in the Bible. Variant a difference in the spelling of a word or the wording of a text when comparing two or more manuscripts.
Vaticanus, or B, the 4th century manuscript used with the Sinaiticus as the catalyst for the modern versions. It received its name after its Vatican guardianship, which is the headquarters of Roman Catholicism. John 9.00-10.2